we're here to sort of change subjects a little bit from the previous session uh, and uh, on a riff, uh, in a riff on a popular TV show, uh, uh, improv comedy TV show, uh, uh, this the session is titled, Whose Data Is It Anyway? Um, and this in some ways is the central question that I think will animate our discussion. We have three excellent speakers here. Uh, uh, Jean-Yves A from uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, and he is based in Geneva and uh, uh, manages um, uh, uh, manages relations between Microsoft and, and uh, multilateral uh, uh, bodies uh, on the public policy front. Uh, Michi Chaudhary is somebody I've actually known for several years now. It's great, great to see her again uh, here in New York City. Uh, she's a lawyer by training, as practices both in the U.S. and India, and is very vocal. Uh, and passionate also about uh, a lot of uh, uh, data privacy and, uh, and other related issues, which, which we'll talk about in a minute. And of course, uh, uh, Sanjay Joshi, who is the chairman of uh, the Observer Research Foundation, a former civil servant, served in a number of different uh, official capacities uh, in his uh, long career in the Indian Administrative Service in India. Um, what I'm going to do, because we only have one hour, is really start off by asking just two or three questions each to our panelists, uh, rather than having long opening statements, uh, and then make it more of a discussion by opening it up to all of you for, for questions and comments. So I'm going to start off by uh, turning to uh, Jean-Yves and asking uh, a simple question. Uh, the, the issue of whose data is it anyway? Uh, who owns a data? Is it a consumer? Is it the state? Is it private companies? Um, why is it important? Why are we discussing this issue today? Well, it's, uh, thanks very much. I'm very happy to be uh, here with you. Uh, very interested in the in the, in the uh, previous panels, uh, trying to follow what was going on, but very interested. Um, we're coming to a, to a topic which is uh, uh, closer to what I'm doing every day, I believe. Um, uh, whose data is it anyway? So the, da the data is uh, the way it is the way we see it uh, at Microsoft. Uh, the data belongs to the users. Uh, but the question whether the data belongs to the users, to the company that's collecting it, to the state, uh, or to any other third party has a number of implications, um, again, uh, for each of those entities in their respective relationship to the data. When I say, for instance, that uh, from our perspective the data belongs to users, it has a number of implications for the users and also for companies like Microsoft, which are collecting the data, hosting the data in data centers. We are not the owners of the data. We are the custodians of the data. And we need, as a company which is, uh, to which users are, are giving the data, we need to behave as good stewards uh, of the data for, for the customers, which, which means, uh, first and foremost, that we need to protect the data. That's why um, when the data goes to data centers, the, the, thing, the, the one thing which for me is very interesting uh, when you look at the question of data is, is the following, is that for centuries, people have kept their data for themselves in their home. And with the advent of the cloud, now people are giving the data to a third party which puts it in data centers, which means that people no longer have the data in their, their home, and, and it's difficult for them to access the data. And therefore, it, it, it creates a very uh, strong responsibility on the part of the data centers and the data center managers, like companies such as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, to protect the data, to act as the good steward uh, of the data which means that it has a, a number of implications, for instance, in terms of technology. The data in a Microsoft Cloud uh, uh, data center is always encrypted. Uh, and so we have to find and to develop good uh, encryption. The fact that the data is encrypted I mean, creates a number of constraints uh, on the uh, follow-up engineering uh, uh, development. And we have to, to live with it. You, you don't process encrypted data. So you need to find methods of encryption which will continue to protect the data and still enable the user of the data to process the data despite the fact that it's encrypted. And we're working on that. So it's, it's one example. It has also uh, other um, uh, implications um, because, uh, again, we are hosting the data of users in data centers. One question which we always um, consider very carefully is where do we establish a data center? 
And when we decide where to establish a data center, we are going to do a very thorough review of the um, extent to which the country and the government where we put the data center will be able to protect the data. What is the tradition in the country in terms of access to data, in terms of privacy? What is the extent of the privacy which is recognized in the country? And so that's the, that's the second aspect. We have the technology, we have the place where we put the data center, and then there is the question of how do we, as steward of the data, as custodian of the data, do we react when we have um, 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 uh, regulators or law enforcement agencies that request access to the data. And there, I mean, the way we take it is pretty simple. It's, okay, if you, law enforcement agencies, want access to the data, and if the data were still in the hands of the customer and the users, there would be a number of rules and regulations that you, you would need to comply with in order to get access to the data. You would probably need a, a, a court order um, which is reasoned and which is giving you access to the data for very precisely, uh, for a very precise time, um, and, and data hopefully located in a very precise um, uh, location. If you give us the data, we will probably require the same thing. We want the same rules to apply to us. We want the, 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 the law enforcement agencies to follow the same process with us. You want to have access to the data. If you had to go to the customer and get it, you would have to comply with a number of rules. Those rules should be complied with if you want to go to, uh, to um, um, IT companies that are hosting the data in their data center. So it has implications in terms of encryptions. It has implications in terms of location of the data centers. It has an, uh, uh, implication in terms of relationship and reaction to law enforcement agencies that want access to the data. So when you are asking what are the implications of, um, uh, what the, why is it important, what does it imply to answer the question who owns the data, um, th this is at least part of the answer. That's the way we, we see it. So the, the relationship you've described is somewhat akin to, say, a person and their a bank account, which is it's their money. It's been entrusted to a bank. The bank can profit off of it. The bank can use it in certain ways. It, it's, and it is somewhat insured in some ways vis-a-vis -vis the state. Would you say that that's a good analogy for, uh, or how would it differ? Well, it, it is, um, to some extent, um, it's an interesting analogy. The fact is, when you, when you go to the bank and you, you deposit your money there, you know that the bank is going to use it and to, and to use it to lend the money to, to, to third parties. When you, when you give your data to uh, a company, the company is not supposed to take your data and give it to others um, or enable others to, to, to use it. And the company has had some issues with, with that uh, in, in that way. So, so I think that that's, uh, that's where it's an interesting analogy because you are, you are entrusting someone with something which is of value to you and you ask that person to be the good steward of your, uh, of, of your, uh, of your assets, uh, but then the rules of what the, what the steward can do vary from, from one to the other. Uh, Mishi, if I can turn to you, uh, obviously, I mean, uh, Jean-Yves laid out how a major company, multinational corporation like uh, Microsoft views this, views this issue. Um, but you practice in India, you've practiced law in the US. Are there different government approaches in the US and India to this issue of who owns data and how, how does it differ? Sure. Um, yeah, I wish um, the approaches were the same, um, but as a lawyer, um, it's always good not to have clarity because then you can charge people to provide <laughs> some clarity. Um, I think data is like people. You interrogate it hard enough and it will tell you whatever you want to hear. Um, I, this thing about data ownership is a question very, very um, confusing for me. I usually think that it is better to be asking who has the right to a data rather than asking ownership of data because ownership does not really tell us very clearly, what do I do with this? Okay, it's me, my name, things about me which other people have gathered, but then what do I do? And each time we talk about ownership, and Dhruv, just like your analogy about uh, putting it in bank, then I want to make something out of it. I want to monetize it. But in my hand, it's not really as useful as it's perhaps in the hand of some of the platform companies who are missing from this panel. Um, uh, Microsoft now has the enviable position of the company which can actually talk about very good practices 
uh, about how to deal with uh, data, but uh, and also um, the changes in the U.S. law and Cloud Act, which has been possible because of the Microsoft case. So I, I personally think that uh, it's better to ask about who has rights to certain kinds of data rather than saying who owns data, because everything is about context. Who is processing it? Who's collecting it? Who's using it? All of these questions determine more about data. So the question you asked me actually, and just like a lawyer, I changed the answer to whatever <laughs> I wanted to say. Um, I think the primary problem for us, both in this country as well as my home country, uh, is that uh, law has to be clear enough to work, and there isn't enough clarity conceptually on very, very basic issues. What is data? Now, American view, before we talk about that, we must recognize that India is the world's fastest growing major economy, as well as the world's fastest mobile data consuming nation. Why this is important is because now firms have been very eager to capitalize on the huge opportunity India presents, particularly after China and a similar market access has been denied to them. And this really determines all kind of regulation and policies. And now, uh, let me present a couple of examples of how this unclarity we have about concepts works out in both these legal systems in India. In the US, the question, which is a very important question in India right now, is that uh, data be does data belong collectively to US or the nation? It's not an interesting question to the Americans. Um, because it, it should be that whatever these big general, general categories are, who owns data, whether collective data is an asset, et cetera, these should be simple answers, but these conversations are completely different. Nobody's finding this an interesting question in the United States. They are very different legal systems. In America, the major question for American platform companies is, do all the data of the world belong to us or not? <laughs> that's precisely what determines. All data belong to us, and that's what we want to know. Which is a very, very different question than do the data of Indian people belongs to the Indian companies or the government of India, which uh, I am not that rich and neither am I that powerful, but you know who I am referring to and how we have been talking about this conversation in India. Now, as from time to time, I have pointed out in my writing something called, which later came to be known as digital colonialism, but we shouldn't be surprised how this balance works between these two countries, whether it's the US or India. We are still oddly talking in these two different jurisdictions in a way where one side is thinking in very imperial terms, how does the data of the world belong to us? And the other side is thinking in very national and anti-imperial terms, can we draw a line or a border inside which we are the autonomous, dominant force, whether we are the companies or the state that governs us. And that's why this entire conversation in India about digital colonialism, data localization, where um, the understanding about cloud to mobile, mobile architecture is. Now, implicit in these remarks coming from Indian businesses, Indian governments are that there's an express acknowledgement of the immense success foreign companies, read American platform companies, have achieved relative to their Indian counterparts. They have dominated the internet landscape in India, some because of what they have actually been able to do in terms of innovation, rest also lack of clear regulations in that part of the world. That doesn't mean that there is very clear regulation in this part of the world either, which is also very siloed. Nonetheless, we are still talking about an outward facing and inward facing form of thinking. And there is no real awareness about ownership of data or who and how they are going to be treated in this thing. This, the other thing, and I'm glad John Eads already alluded to that, and in fact, not just alluded, talked about a little bit more and told us how it's done and what their priorities are. This is about the processing of data. And that's why, again, asking whether you have a right to a picture of yours, the revenge porn really explains to us. There is, unfortunately, this term, but that's the most widely used term. But do I own that data? But does somebody else have a copyright on my photograph? 
and uh, as always, because movie industry is far more powerful than any of us are, copyright works. That's how you use it. Now, in terms of processes, the analyzers of data, it turns out to be a little more complicated question because uh, although we like this anti-imperial term, but computer technology does not work like that in 21st century. Data is stored over here, and a database is made or inferred over there, and a query is made in some other place to it, which is how the cl cloud to mobile architecture works in today's world. Now, the whole effort of our technology has been to delocalize, in that sense, the computing of any of this data, to separate the processing and the storage of data on two very different continents. But when we talk about it, we are usually hearing from the regulator, regulators or telecommunication companies as if the processing occurred in one place by one person, and the question is who owned that particular data. That's why in India, the government policy is made as though the data of Indians means storing it on servers in India and never having it on a disk drive everywhere else. And there are obviously 10 feet high walls which will protect your data. Um, sorry, that joke didn't land. But <laughs> <laughs> that's mostly because Indian government did argue in the Supreme Court of India to say Aadhaar data is so well protected because the walls are 10 feet high. So <laughs> uh, I'm obviously not a very good stand-up comedian. My jokes are not even landing here. <laughs> but I have to say that we can't talk about processing of data as if it's processing of ore. It was uh, pulverized iron in one time, and now it's pig iron in another time. In the United States, again, it's, there is a lot of effort now, because obviously when California does something, everybody is scared. So everybody's moving towards, because CCPA is going to be a reality by January of 2020. So uh, companies always like to come down and to the standards. So if we have a national omnibus legislation, which will be much easier than the liberal California, which has gone rogue. So India and US are talking in very different terms. And that's where data's ownership is not going to be decided at all. Uh, thank you, Michi. Uh, you know, as you yourself alluded to, um, um, the, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty, and particularly in India, where the di the digital landscape is changing so rapidly, and and use the user base is growing so rapidly. So that that's actually a ni nice transition to uh, Mr. Joshi. What are the current debate? I mean, how is this shaping up in India? What is changing? Where are the debates? Where do you see it headed? Uh, thanks. Uh, the, the, the debates in India are very much part of the debates which are taking place globally. Uh, but let me uh, say where I come from in this uh, whole debate, because uh, you, you've just heard uh, uh, Eves from uh, Microsoft talking about this. You heard a very competent lawyer talking about it. I'm neither. No, I'm going to drive this truck without a driving license, mm -hmm. fundamentally. And I'm, to, I'm going to drive this as uh, uh, the illiberal liberal that I am. Uh, Mishi's, uh, uh, Mishi made a very good point, and I'd like to take that forward. You know, this entire conceptualization of the idea of data, what is data, is extremely important when we start drawing up legal frameworks. The problem is we still have not conceptualized data. We, we are examining data in the legal system. When we talk of jurisprudence, when we talk about how data is to be understood, we are looking at it under old systems. And our, our natural response is to look at data as a resource to start talking about data as, OK, money in the bank, to start talking about data as if it is oil or as if it is iron ore. There are fundamental problems when you start treating data in those terms, because data is not a resource in the traditional sense. And for various reasons. Now, fundamentally, how is data created? How is data generated? How is data used? Is my data my own? Every time I take a Uber, I generate data. It is not my data. My phone generates data. We move into the Internet of Things. Every device I use, my refrigerator generates data about me. No. So data is being generated all the time. And the, the analogy I use is that we radiate data. That is what we are doing. And we radiate data just as, yes, radiation is lethal. So data can be lethal. It can be used lethally against us also. So you can, you can be generating data while you're taking your uh, Uber ride uh, today, 
and that someone is going to make use of the data, probably they'll find you the closest McDonald's on the basis of the data they've generated from you, which is great. Or that same data can be used to target a drone and send it to assassinate someone in a cave deep in Kandahar. Now, there are different uses which that data is, be, is, is, is being put to. So that is why the question of how we understand data, whether there should be different value systems governing the use of data by different organizations, private companies use data, whether there should be different value systems governing the use of data by private corporations, and different value systems governing the use of that same data by states. Should, should that, you know, should, that, should there be different value systems? You know, we are in an age where that question becomes extremely important today. And that is why this debate between uh, the surveillance capitalism on the one hand and surveillance state is an extremely valid debate. India's Aadhaar program, you know. In India, when you start talking about the concept of privacy, if you ask the ordinary citizen, he considers the Aadhaar card which he gets not an intrusion of his privacy. He regards it as a privilege of citizenship. It says he, he, it gets me benefits. You know, I'm, I'm finally, we, I've got a document to prove my own citizenship, which may come in news when the government introduces the next NRC somewhere else in the state, the NRC, you know. Aadhaar becomes a great basis to prove that, yes, I am an Indian citizen. But ask an Uyghur, you know, living in Xinjiang, whether facial recognition software, which is used, is a privilege of citizenship, you're going to get a very different answer. So again, it is how the data is being used. So I treat the whole question differently, but I look at it from a very different perspective. Ultimately, when you start talking about data, raw data is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Now, it is available loads and loads and loads and tons of it. The value you generate from data is in the users, the processing, the refining, and what the superstructure which you build on the basis. They're data-led services which build value. Now, there are certain companies which is data repositories, the servers which store all your data residing somewhere. Amazon may be doing it, someone else may be doing it. When governments start legislating, they run into problems. You, know, you have the Patriot Act. You have the Cloud Act. They seem to presume you start talking about ownership of data. Fundamentally, companies start saying data belongs to the user. But then you have a Cloud Act which not only gives data rights, forget the user, forget anybody else, forget, forget the company collecting the data. It is giving that right over your data to the company which is storing the data. But by saying that, yes, that is a company which will be sharing your data and they'll be forced to share it. So we are, we are, we are entering a legal gray zone because many of these terms have not been clearly defined. They have not been very clearly demarcated. So yes, there are problems about ownership. So we need to start thinking in terms of the data value chain. And again, my, by using the same analogy from nuclear science, radiation, every data has a half-life. Some have shorter half-life, some have longer half-life. Data anonymized, data you know, created differently is a, is a great use. You today have a great movement also, which started some time ago on open data. Open data is a great resource, yes. Suitably anonymized, even health data is of great use. It, it, it generates solutions. It, it can be used for the good of mankind. So we need to start thinking of data in very, very different terms, and then start drawing up legal frameworks. There need to be far greater conversations about between countries. And these the firewalls which people build, the problem today is that each country is moving into very, very different kinds of data regulation. That is bad. Because you're dealing with a commodity which is universal, which resides everywhere. You cannot have different kinds of laws governing different jurisdictions because you are destroying too much value in this whole process. So yes, that is why data nationalism ultimately is wrong. It, 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 is, it is not something which is going to uh, you know, jail very much. It is, not, it is not the way of the future. It may be a temporary step where certain countries trying to play catch up Certain companies in certain countries trying to play catch up, yes, put some barriers, put some resistance, but eventually the way forward is going to be more universal norms around data, and that is how we're going to be using it. 
Uh, if I can just uh, follow up very quickly on that. In your experience as somebody who has worked in the government in various capacities, as somebody who's worked outside of government in the private sector and in, and in a think tank, uh, let a think tank, where, why do you see this gap in some ways between good regulation, I mean, take the Indian case, but I think it applies in other countries as well, between good regulation, is it simply a lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of concepts? Do people in government, are, are people in government formulating the policy, whether they're legislators or bureaucrats or, or politicians, simply not aware of the changing pace of technology and what it means? Uh, where is, where is the, the... So this problem has occurred in every sphere, and uh, you know, the, the, the technology sphere particularly. And you talk about data, but this is uh, the, the problem of playing catch up with new developments, with new technologies has existed ever since the Industrial Revolution came into, came into being. Uh, today, the pace of change is much faster. And yes, governments have been very slow to understand and, and play catch up. The challenge is that the pace of change is actually so rapid. You know, every, forget every five years, every few months, technologies change. New questions are thrown up. We need to look at it, you know, when we start looking about data ownership, data regulation, you need to look at, there are, there are, there are three, three parties to this. One is, of course, the state. The other is corporations. And the third is individuals and society. Now, I see this as where the, the three need to actually exercise very strong checks and balances on each other. They need to be. I mean, there, that is, there, there has to be constant vigilance on these factors, and each will need to start educating the other in, in this. We are all stakeholders in this, and the stakes are very, very high for all of us, you know, for, for us as citizens, for corporations, and even for governments. Governments will be slow to catch up, and we are already experiencing the problems. For example, GDPR. The GDPR is actually very populist legislation. No, it, it is ultimately the voice of saying, oh yes, data belongs to the individual. There are problems with the GDPR. The moment you share data, I mean, you can choose to say, I will not radiate data ABC and not tick that box when you, you know, sign on to a site. And I'm not going to share this data, this is my personal data. That is, your, that is the extent of your control. The moment you have shared that data, it has gone. The fact of ownership actually becomes ambiguous. It becomes dubious. Where does that ownership reside? Who has the rights again to process it? So we need to start thinking of what kind of rights reside over data, with whom, and at what level. And there is, there is going to be a progression. This is something which is going to take time to build up. It is not going to happen overnight. We are going to, by various misdirections, find the way out. It is going to be a long process, but we will get there. And a final uh, question for Misha before we open it up. Um, uh, you know, Mr. Joshi said that he believes that data nationalism is, is a passing phase, that, that, we, you know, that is a sort of immediate response. We may, we may get past it at some point. Is it too utopian to think that we could have laws that will apply that are even across state boundaries? Or will it be, you know, is, is, is the sovereignty of data, will, will, will national boundaries start, will digital boundaries start mirroring national boundaries? Is that inevitable? Um, so um, simple answers, which I usually don't give, they don't pay enough. Um, so is- <laughs> Too, too if, few billable hours. <laughs> but if I would say, uh, yes, it's utopian. Um, uh, we, what has actually really worked? Even with human rights violation, we're not able to do much. We all thought after the Second World War, we are going to be in a framework where things will start working. We've had mistakes all over the place. This is a very different thing. It's a very, very much driven by how uh, lucrative it is for everybody to process all that data which is coming in. All the platform companies, which are far more powerful than any of the governments we have seen right now, in terms of what they know about us, is unprecedented. So to think that there's going to be an international kind of legislation, and I think jean -Yves can talk about it, about Microsoft has been trying to talk about a digital Geneva Convention, which will have some parts about this. But I think it's utopian. I also do think one of the important things is that um, all of you here, how many of you are right now on Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp because this is too boring or jargony? Um, great. I think most of you should be. Um, because, um, and also please call out when we're using too much jargon. Um, but how many of you have actually ever bothered to read the terms and conditions? 
Uh, you are either a lawyer More or you have too much time. Okay, I, can't four, I can't four people in the audience who raise that. Or, five, five uh, or you are very smart. I will say that they're deliberately written in order to cover everything and to basically tell you everything does belong to the companies. The second part of this is that we ourselves, and I think Mr. Joshi is absolutely correct about this, um, the regulation will happen, but regulation will work the way regulation works. There will be lobbying groups. Everybody will talk and get their own little piece out there. Civil society does not have a very strong lobbying group. What you do have is you yourself, as conversant you are in the meme culture, as well as in how to use some of these apps, that, how, that is how well conversant you should be in protecting yourselves and being secure online on your own. And that's not to say that don't push for better products which actually do protect your own privacy and data, demand better products, but also try to be a little more vigilant about what you are using. That's not to say all the burden is on us. We can demand a product where you can freely exchange pictures and ideas and even nudes, et cetera, and you can also be assured that none of that is going to be leaked to anybody who is not the intended recipient. So this is a place where you have to watch out for yourself because governments are so interested in, monetize, in actually using this for control because every government, whether it's the one here or in authoritarian countries like China, um, are going to come after that. This is something which authoritarian regimes like the Stalin or the Stasi dreamt of. Now, you are give, now we all carry these devices which are reporting back to the gulags. So this is a dream they have. The corporations, which are conveniently absent from many of such discussions, is they, they like what you do, whether you fight online, whether you are expressing outrage online, they're collecting behavior. They're behavior collection mechanisms. There is only one business model, and that is surveillance capitalism. They're, they haven't figured out yet any of the business models. Automatic cars are not coming in the five years as we thought they were coming. Android is not making as much money as still advertising makes. So this is also about Yes, demand better from your governments, demand better products from the corporations, but it's also about protecting ourselves. It is utopian to think that we will come to some kind of an agreement at an international level, because mostly our motivations as companies, as governments, as well as citizens, are all tearing us apart in very different directions. Uh, just since uh, it was uh, Microsoft's role was referenced, I just wanted you to have a quick word. Uh, is is do you hope that a, a digital Geneva Convention is possible? If we didn't believe that a digital Geneva Convention uh, uh, is possible, we would never have <laughs> talked about it. So yes, of course, we believe that uh, that's something which is possible. That's an interesting question. And you, you have made really super, uh, uh, very, very interesting point, the, the, the two of you. Uh, I was I think, <laughs> giving a lot of thoughts to to, uh, to all the points you were making. Let's talk a little bit about the, the regulation that, that, that you were uh, indicating. And we can talk about the Digital Geneva Convention uh, also in the same, uh, on the same path. Um, of course, I, I, I'm probably biased because uh, I live uh, and work uh, in Geneva, so in a world of international organizations. Uh, and um, international organizations which uh, have come to realize um, not too long ago um, that something um, could probably be and should probably be done about uh, uh, digitization. Um, in particular, as you probably know, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Guterres, uh, has uh, commissioned um, a report uh, on um, digital cooperation, uh, where he has uh, set up a panel of experts uh, and asked them to think about what the UN should do uh, to um, ensure a better governance uh, of the um, uh, digitization, uh, which is digital transformation, which is ongoing. And that report contains a number of uh, very interesting recommendations that go th from uh, work on inclusion, half of the world is connected, it's good, 
half of the world is not connected. That's a drama. So that it's bad. It's a drama. Half of the world is not connected. Um, goes to human rights. Uh, we have um, a universal declaration of human rights. We need to think a little bit what the declaration means in the 21st century, in the digital era. Uh, what does privacy mean? What does freedom of expression mean? What does access to a decent work, which is one of the human rights, what does access to a human rights mean in the 21st century? And so, um, and then there are a number of recommendations also on, on security, on trust, um, on human agency, uh, very important uh, at a time when the, uh, when artificial intelligence systems are becoming more popular and, and used in a number of different uh, industries. Um, so the, the one thing which I find interesting is that there is a um, sort of awareness uh, at an international level that this digital transformation needs to be governed, needs governance, needs rules, and that the um, appropriate uh, level at which those rules uh, should be considered is an international level because uh, digital industries are global by nature, so global rules um, should probably be think about. You were referencing the uh, GDPR, uh, which uh, was when it was adopted and, and also when it actually took force uh, probably the most modern uh, piece of um, regulation on privacy um, in the digital world, which has inspired uh, other regulators, and we see probably a trend towards more convergence on, on privacy. We'll see to what extent it's, it's going, but there is this tendency of, first, more governance, and second, the governance at a more uh, multilateral level or international level, which I, which I find interesting. The Digital Geneva Convention goes in that direction. Um, one of the, if, if we want um, users to take full advantage of uh, digital tools and digital services, you need to ensure privacy, security, and safety. And security is uh, the object of this Digital Geneva Convention. We need to protect users against hackers, and we need also to protect users against governments when governments launch cyber attacks, which was the case with uh, WannaCry, which has been the case with NotPetya, and which we know, because we are Microsoft, we know that 10,000 users have been the subject matter and the target of cyber attacks coming from governments in this past year. So we need to do something about that if we want users to really take full advantage of the tools which exist and which can be very helpful to them. And that's why we are pushing for uh, more norms and compulsory norms uh, on cybersecurity. It is, when we launched, uh, when we talked about the adoption of the Digital Geneva Convention, we knew that it, would take, that it will take time. We know that it's going to take time. We know that we are on a path. At this stage, probably the best step which has been taken and the most important one which has been taken was taken in November last year, uh, just before IGF in Paris. It's the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, which was run by President Macron, which sets out nine principles which very much um, uh, if you want, we state principles that have been adopted, discussed in other fora, uh, such as the UNGGE or G7, uh, and which is now being implemented, uh, or, or, or at least uh, governments, companies, civil society are trying to think, what does it mean, for instance, to preserve the integrity of the internet? What does it mean? What should we do? And so that's, that's where we're going. The Paris Call is a very important step on a path which is going to take several years, but that goes in the right direction of um, improving security uh, on, uh, uh, on the internet. Can I intervene there? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, okay. But, but, uh, quickly, in two minutes, please. I want to give time for yeah, okay. questions. Oh, yes. no, uh, to, to, the, to the question of whether you will have a Geneva Convention on data, uh, I don't think so. Uh, Geneva Conventions have not worked in any other area. What you are going to have is uh, something exactly coming from the opposite direction. Like you have tax havens, you will have data havens. And there will be jurisdictions will try and create these data ha havens to get the best investments in technologies. And various countries are st going to start experimenting uh, with these kind of Guantanamo Bay kind of enclaves and other enclaves where you have free access to data. And 
those are the jurisdictions, the argument being that those jurisdictions are going to be at the cutting edge of new developments in technology. They're going to forge ahead, they're going to lead ahead. Now that is going to set off a chain reaction of competition between various jurisdictions, which will ultimately may level out the playing field. It, it may completely happen from the opposite direction. Well, with that, please join me in thanking the three panelists, and I'll turn it over to Abhinandan. Thank you.